Hello and welcome to another session on data mining. Today we are going to be talking about different types of learning problems in data science and machine learning. So if you take a look at what we've been doing, doing overall, we've learned about structural risk minimization that essentially says that we should minimize training error over a given training set using a loss function and we should also regularize. And regularization ensures that we don't fall uh, into the trap of the butterfly effect at a small change in the input or due or a noise in the input uh, training data uh, or in terms of the features uh, for a given example uh, has a significant effect on the output okay so that is the overall common theme that we we've, we've seen in our discussions on uh, uh, regression on classification as well as dimensionality reduction and we're going to take the same theme forward and think of other problems that in, that can be learned or uh, that fall in the remit of machine learning, okay? So just to recap, uh, supervised classification, we've talked about that. We can, we can separate between apples and oranges. We can have multi-class classification in which we can uh, classify between different types of objects like apples, mangoes, and oranges. And to do that, we can have either a one versus all or a one against one type of classifier. And these are pretty simple uh, extensions of binary classifiers, and uh, these are available in different packages in Python, and you're welcome to try them out for multi-class classification. Okay, and we've also talked about uh, specific classifiers. For so if you take an example of a support vector machine, uh, it's a simple linear representation with a with a regularization term, which is a square of the norm, which we know now that it maximizes the margin between the two classes. Uh, so the boundary of the classifier would pass or the line represented by the first uh, equation over here it passes through an area of low data density and uh, then we have an empirical error that is based on the hinge loss which is shown over here it only incurs a loss whenever this this margin is violated we use this regular regularization and the empirical error formulation we have over here in the form of an optimization problem which can then be solved using gradient descent uh, or quadratic programming uh, existing solvers out there we already know that they use quadratic programming if the problem is kernelized but you can also use gradient descent which is a very simple method you calculate the loss at a given point you calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weights of the support vector machine and then you update the weights in the direction opposite to the gradient using a small uh, uh, small step size okay so that's the overall uh, representation evaluation and optimization construct construction of support vector machine. We've also talked about dimensionality reduction in terms of principal component analysis there. The representation is pretty much similar. We have a linear, uh, we want to find a vector W so that if I project all of my data Xi onto that vector, the variance in my data should be, uh, along that direction should be maximized. Or in other words, the loss in the total variance should be minimized. We've seen that formulation and we've discussed that when uh, we talked about principal component analysis. Uh, similarly, we've also talked about regression problems where we have a figure or a picture, for example, of a person and we want to predict their age. So prediction of real numbers, essentially uh, from any type of independent variables, in this case an image, is called regression. So we've talked about how we can use different type of machine learning methods such as uh, support vector regression, ordinary least square regression, and there are so many others as well uh, for, for solving this problem. So if you talk about the support vector regression problem, again, we know that the representation is again linear. It uses a specific loss function, which is different from the support vector machine loss function. In the support vector machine for classification, we use the hinge loss, and we derived how we can get to that loss uh, by simply uh, using the constraints that stem up naturally in the formulation of the classification problem. But when we are talking about uh, the regression problem we see that we want to minimize the difference between the predicted between the predicted and the actual target however small changes within that variation the small errors with between the prediction and the output do not need to be penalized that's why we have an epsilon insensitive loss function in support vector regression which can be plotted like this so it doesn't incur any loss if the error between the predicted output which is uh, f of x and the actual output for a given example, which is y, is less than epsilon. So in this case, if we set epsilon equal to 0.5, there is no loss over here. However, as we as the 
as the machine learning model deviates from the target by a large amount, we start producing a loss function and then we try to formulate this and then we formulate this in the form of an optimization problem such that we want to minimize the impact of these errors as well as ensure regularization which is the first part on your left. So that's the overall effect of uh, support vector regression. So that is the breakdown in terms of representation, evaluation and optimization. And if you notice something, the only difference between the three problems that we've talked about, classification, regression and dimensionality reduction, the representation has been the same, the regularization has been the same. The only difference that we've seen is in terms of the loss function itself. For uh, support vector classification, we had the hinge loss. For regression, we had this epsilon insensitive loss. Alternatively, if you want to do ordinary least square regression, you can use uh, the square error loss, uh, which incurs a higher penalty on the errors generated by your machine learning model. And in terms of the principal component analysis, uh, uh, for dimensionality reduction, the loss function was actually the change, how much variance do we lose? So the amount of variance lost is acting as an, as an error or a loss function. Now, this is, the, this is the theme that I want you to learn. For different types of problems, all you need to do essentially is to formulate different types of loss functions. And once you have done that, you can pretty much formulate the same thing into, into an optimization problem and then solve that optimization problem. Okay. So if you are given, like if you, if you come up with a new problem in uh, data science or in machine learning, essentially think of how we can represent a solution to that problem. How can we represent errors associated with that problem? And then how can we derive an optimization problem that allows us to solve that problem? Now, the good thing about this lean, very simple linear representation that we have spent way too long on is, uh, is that it's really simple. And then the, another thing about, another really good thing about this is that it can also be kernelized so we can solve non linearly separable problems using pretty much the same framework. So that's, that's pretty handy. So I hope you have now a good understanding of uh, why we took this approach, this representation, evaluation, and optimization approach, and why we started off with different uh, with very simple linear classifiers or linear learning models. Uh, it's also important that you you have a good intuitive understanding of the different type of loss functions that are used in, in these different types of problems, okay, and why we need these different type of loss functions. And to, to, to really understand this, ask yourselves these questions. Can we use hinge loss for regression? Can we use variance reduction for classification. Can we use a regression loss function for classification? And so on. And I welcome you to think on these questions so that you know why a specific loss function is used for a given problem. However, the problems in um, uh, data science and in machine learning are not limited to regression, classification, and dimensionality reduction. There are other types of problems. Uh, the, for example, there are there's a problem called feature selection in which you want to select which features are the most important for a given classification or for a given regression problem. Similarly, you can have nonlinear dimensionality reduction, and we've discussed that briefly in our discussion on uh, follow, following up from PCA. There are other problems such as learning uh, to do novelty or outlier detection, so doing what is called one class classification. So Typically, when we do binary classification, we are trying to discriminate between two different objects. But what if it's really hard to get data from one for one class? So, for example, if you want to determine whether a machine is uh, working uh, working well or not, to use classical classification or binary classification, you would need data for both behaviors of the machine when it's functioning normally and when it's not functioning normally, right? but it may be very hard to get data for, for cases when it's not functioning normally. You can think of the same problem in terms of credit card fraud, right? To, do a, to solve that problem using classification or binary classification, we would need examples of both types, right? Normal behavior and abnormal behavior. But can we use only the normal behavior to detect whenever that behavior isn't there, so detect of abnormalities, okay? Similarly, there's a problem called learning to rank. So instead of classifying or regress, uh, regression, uh, 
uh, can we learn to rank things? So this, uh, for example, I like this movie better than this other movie or like this pizza better than this other pizza, so on. And that can also lead to design of recommender systems. There are also problems for uh, like, uh, that. so recommender systems are the things that are used in, uh, in uh, Netflix, for example, or Google or Amazon, and, and how do how can we solve those uh, types of problems? Similarly, there are other problems like clustering, reinforcement learning, and uh, survival prediction. And what this uh, part, this session is going to give you is a, is a detailed introduction to each one of those problems. However, however before moving on to different types of uh, machine learning problems, we're just going to give a brief, I'm going to give a brief, brief recap uh, or a review of different types of uh, linear models, okay? So we know that linear models are the models in which the representation is simply f of x is equal to w transpose x. So the parameters of the model are w, and you can also include a bias term if required. And if we have a loss function like this one uh, that measures the, the output of this model and the target or the error between the target and the output squares it and sums it up for all of the examples, we essentially end up with an optimization problem, which is called the ordinary least square regression problem, right? And then you can solve this problem by taking the derivative of this loss function with respect to the weights and solving that, that gives us a closed form solution, right? Similarly, if we have a regularizer with the, with the optimization problem, with the, with the square error loss, we essentially call it rigid regression. And if we replace the loss function with, uh, with an epsilon insensitive loss function, we end up with a support vector regression model. If you use a hinge loss function, then we can use the same structure of the linear uh, linear model for classification, and this is called a support vector machine. We can kernelize each one of these if we want to. Okay, so that's the good thing about these. In order to understand, so so these linear models, here's the general structure of them of of these linear models. You have a loss function that is calculated for different types of examples. For each of the examples, we typically sum all of these examples, the losses of all of these examples together, and uh, we want to minimize these losses with respect to the parameters, which, is, which are weights and biases of your machine learning model. And we typically have a regularization term, and then we have a term called lambda that controls the relative compromise between regularization and uh, empirical error minimization. So this is the general form of structural risk minimization. Okay. So that's uh, the general form. We can use different type of loss functions. For example, we want to use the zero one loss function and we've discussed why that's not a good idea because it has this nasty discontinuity in it. Okay. So that's the problem there. Uh, we can use that for classification hinge loss. We've discussed that and that can be used uh, for classification as well. We talked about the perceptron loss, which is essentially zero whenever the output y into f of x for a classification problem is greater than zero. And it's important to note that in this case, for this classification problem, y um, belongs to either plus one or minus one. So that's the only case, uh, that, that's where this loss function is uh, applicable. Okay, so it, uh, there is no loss whenever you have uh, y times f of x greater than zero, but it does have a loss when it is less than zero, right? So this is a decision function for a, for a positive example, in which case y is equal to plus one. Okay, but you can also derive the same thing for when y is equal to minus one. Similarly, you can also have a logistic loss, and I'm going to show you the equation for that loss, which is shown over here, this in this blue color. And as you can see, it has a low loss whenever the prediction is correct or when f of x is pretty large, but as f of x becomes smaller, especially when it goes negative, it decreases. Uh, so the loss story increases uh, and, and we can see that over here. And if you think about it, this log loss is also a convex over approximation of this zero one loss. So, so all of these loss functions can be used for classification. Similarly, we have a squared hinge loss, which uh, is shown over here, which is simply the square of the of the hinge loss function. And we have got another loss function called the Hubert loss, and there can be so many other types of losses okay, that are applicable and they would give you different types of machine learning problems.
what I want you to, to understand is, is a generic concept here. We can plug in different type of loss functions, but those the choice of that loss function affects the type of problems we can solve in, um, and, and also what type of algorithms we end up, end up with. Some of these losses are easier to optimize. So for example, a squared loss is a bit easier to optimize in comparison to, let's say the zero one loss, which leads to a combinatorial optimization problem, which is really nasty in terms of optimization, okay? Uh, similarly, one another thing I want you to notice over here, and that's an important concept in machine learning, is that we, what we're doing over here is we are summing across all of the loss values across all of the examples, individual examples. So, so, so there's an implicit assumption here that we are treating each of the examples independently. Okay, so each example has the same weight in uh, determining the the final classifier. However, if you have class imbalance, for example, you may want to weigh these losses differently. So let's say if you got a positive, a few number of positive examples and a and, uh, and a very large number of negative examples. So the number of positive examples I'm going to indicate by this hash is greater than, much, much greater than the number of negative examples, or P is greater than N. Then in that case, we want to, we can, we can assign different weights to each of these examples as well. So in this case, when the number of positive examples is sufficiently larger than negative ones, we can overcome this data imbalance problem by simply weighing our the loss of our neg over our negative examples a bit more than our positive examples. So this is called class proportionate weighting. Okay. Or class weighting in general. Okay. And this is available in different packages to help you overcome um, the optimization of the data imbalance problem. But, but the concept even goes more, more general than that. So if you look at this, this particular equation over here, then what we see is uh, we are treating each of the examples individually. We may want to weigh it, for example, instead of having uh, e each example a weight of one, we can give it different weights based on class weighting. But at the same time, sometimes these examples, if they're not independent of each other, we can instead of summing over all of these examples, we can do something else as well. We can calculate loss over individual groups of examples, and we can even choose to do the same thing, or this loss calculation over the whole of the data set at once. We're not going to go into details of that just yet, but it's an important uh, thing to understand that this assumption of independence of examples is why we really end up with this summation. So we think that each example is independent of each other. What that essentially means is that one example does not affect the decision of another example. And if that is the case, then on, then and only then this summation is valid. Okay, so that is called uh, uh, independence, independence of examples. Okay, so that's where this summation comes in. Okay. So I hope you are able to understand the general formulation of the structural risk minimization principle. And this is a this is the formulation of the same thing for logistic regression. This is a logistic loss function, which is like if you look at it, it looks really mathematically difficult. There is a product of the target class example with the with the prediction output, then we take an exponent of that and then we take a log of that. But it's really important. Uh, and it's really easy to understand if you break it down. So let's take a take a positive example. So in, for which y, we know that the training label is y is equal to plus one, and then we have got f of x, which is which can be w transpose x if it's a linear model, for example. Now what we want is that we want f of x to produce a positive score, right? So we want that the product of y into f of x should be positive. And if the product of these two things is positive, then what happens is that the exponent of this thing, this whole thing, this thing, because there's a minus in there, is going to be small, okay? And if you take the log of a small number, it's going to be a small number, right? So that's what this loss function does. At the same time, if we have uh, opposite signs, so let's say f of x, instead of producing f of x, uh, a value of greater than zero, it produces a value of 
value less than zero, for an example, for which the label is actually positive, then the product of y times f of x is going to be negative, which multiplied by this negative number is going to produce a positive number. And then we take the exponent of that, and that's going to really make, really increase the value of that error. And then we take the log, so a log of a large number is uh, large, but not very large. Okay, so that's the good thing about taking a log. And this one is essentially there to enforce that we don't end up uh, taking log of negative numbers uh, or, or zero values. Okay, so that is essentially the logistic loss function. And this is used to solve classification problems. So if you are not familiar with this algorithm, this is called logistic regression. But once you know the REO principle, the representation, evaluation, and optimization, you can essentially learn different types of classifiers, different type of machine learning models without going through too much pain. So a representation for this is f of x is equal to w transpose x. You can add a bias term if you want. The evaluation is simply we have this loss function over here. We've already given that. And then we have a regularization term as well. So this is the optimization problem. I'm going to just point this e to this. And then we can solve this optimization problem, say, using gradient descent or any other optimization algorithm. And there are a bunch of really nice al uh, optimization algorithms that allow us to solve these optimization problems. So if you think about it, because this loss function, this logistic loss function, which is shown in red over here, is a convex function. And you can verify that this is a convex function. I've given you some tutorials on how you can determine whether a function is convex or not. And, and because we are summing all of these values, all of these losses, so the sum of the, all of those convex functions is also going to be a convex function. And then this, uh, this thing over here is also a convex function. So this whole overall optimization problem is a convex optimization problem. That means it has a unique optima. That means it has like a structure like this. And you can find this optimization. You can solve this optimization problem using gradient descent. And there's a guarantee that if you choose your step size appropriately, you will essentially end up at the at the proper at the proper or the global minimum of this optimization problem. But there are other algorithms as well. You can even use a quantum computer to actually solve these types of uh, types of machine learning problems. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. But this is the basis of the new fields or new directions in machine learning. So once you have once you framed your optimization problem or your learning problem in the form of an optimization problem, you can solve that using any optimization algorithm. So currently, like classical computers on, on those, we can use stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent. There are other type of methods like, uh, for example, you can have quadratic programming based optimizers. You can also have uh, gradient descent with momentum. And we're going to talk about these different type of optimization methods um, uh, when we discuss deep learning in more details, but the generic cons concepts are already in place over here. We formulate an optimization problem and then we use an optimization algorithm to solve it. Once we get the values of W and B, we have said we say that the training part is done and then we can use that model to generate predictions for a given, uh, given um, test example. And for that, we only need the values, these parameter values W and B and the feature representation X and nothing else. So to training, for training, we need these two bits, the evaluation and the optimization bits. For, but for, for testing, you can just use the, use the representation bit, okay? So I hope this uh, would have helped you, help you cement your understanding of the representation, evaluation, and opt optimization structure. What we're going to do next is to understand like what are the types of regularizers are available and what is the role of regularization? Remember the role of regu regularization is simply to enforce that we don't end up with a classifier which is affected by noise too much or which changes its decision based on a small change in the input, okay? So one of the regularizers that we've talked about is what is called the squared norm regularizer in which we simply add all the squared values of the weights and then we have this regularizer. But you can also have other types of regularizers. One of the more general type of regularizers is called the p-norm regularizer. And this, R, this uh, squared loss regularizer or L2 regularizer as it is called is a specific case of this p-norm regularizer. So in, in, in general, you can have uh, 
you can take the weight vector values w1 w2 to wd if there are d different features you can raise them raise, you can take the absolute values of those you can raise them to the power p and then you can take the pth root of that so if you apply this definition for p is equal to 2 and square that you essentially end up with this function and the good thing about this l2 regularizer is that it's it's uh, convex and uh, it leads to a really simple optimization problem but it has certain disadvantages as well and i'm going to talk about that in just a second but first let's talk about other type of uh, regularizer Let, let's talk about l1 regularizer which is simply the absolute value the sum of absolute values of uh, the weights of your machine learning model okay similarly you can have a zero norm regularizer which is simply the number of non-zero vector elements just to say, help you understand this further let's take an example of uh, w is equal to 1 and 0 0.5 let's say you have a machine learning model that has two parameters one of them is 1 and the other is 0 0.5 if you calculate the two norm of this and use that as a regularizer then that comes out to be 1.18 but it's important to understand what is the geometric meaning of this let's think about this point 1 and 0 0.5 in the form of uh, your in the form of a point in this vector space where you have weight 1 on the x-axis and you have weight 2 on the y-axis so you have this point which corresponds to now 1 and 0 0.5 okay and then this distance from here to here is what this this p is equal to 2 norm is measuring okay so this is distance is also called the straight line distance or as the crow flies distance and the value of this distance from the origin is 1.18 if you take the p is equal to 1 norm of it you're essentially adding 1 and 0 0.5 which uh, which gives you the pth norm of 0. Point, of 1.5 sorry so this is the norm that you get okay and then you if you take like the zeroth norm of it you can essentially get uh, the number of non-zero components because both of these components of the weight vector are non-zero therefore the value of this zero norm is two now let's try to understand what is the impact of using each one of those in our optimization problem okay if we use a regularizer which minimizes p is equal to two norm or we are minimizing w2 then what we are doing is that we are trying to pull this vector along this line towards the origin right that's what we so this is a number that we want to reduce right so we are pulling this point during optimization towards the origin so it's going to reduce the values of both your weight vectors w1 and w2 right and based on this right if we if we use p is equal to 1 and we want to minimize the one norm of w so with p is equal to one then what we're trying to reduce is this height over here and this width over here okay so that's the impact of this norm okay when we, of minimizing this norm and if we want to minimize p is equal to zero then what that does is that it tries to reduce the number of non-zero component so it would try to give uh, give uh, give you weight values that are sparse so that only a small number of those weight values are non-zero okay so now that we have understood the geometric impact of minimizing different types of norms in the regularization function let's take our understanding to the next level and and try to understand what is going to be the impact of these on each of the learning problems so We've, we've seen that if I try to minimize the zero norm instead of the p is equal to two norm, then that is going to reduce the number of non-zero components. So remember, the, uh, the representation of this machine learning problem is going to be w1, x1, and w2, x2. And if one of these is, goes to zero, then essentially we're throwing out that feature, right? So p is equal to zero, if you use that in our, our regularization, that allows us to do feature selection. So that's really the impact of this um, of this optimization problem. Okay, so we can do feature selection if you use p is equal to zero norm in our 
uh, SRM. Okay, but the problem with this, with using this P is equal to zero, is that it is not very easy to optimize. Okay. Now, if we look at P is equal to two, on the other hand, which we have been using, it's really easy to optimize, but it wouldn't lead to reducing it, reducing the, each of the weight values to zero. Okay. Because if you look at this, this has a larger impact uh, or larger value in comparison to this value, right? So if you want to minimize the norm of uh, this thing uh, or this norm, this particular norm, P is equal to zero, it's going to lead to sparser solutions in the weight vector space. So your weights are going to be, only a small fraction of your weights are going to be non-zero if you use P is equal to zero in comparison to when you do P is equal to two. However, this is difficult to optimize, difficult optimization. This is easier optimization. Okay, and I, I leave it to you to guess why this would be difficult to optimize, okay, and why this would be easier to optimize, okay. So, the compromise between the two is to use P is equal to one norm, and that allows us to get gets more sparser solutions than, what, than we would get when we use P is equal to two, but uh, the problem is going to be a bit more difficult to optimize. It may the the loss function, the optimization objective function is going to be a bit rougher in comparison to when you use, excuse me, when you use P is equal to two. Okay, so that's going to be the impact of that. Uh, and I've summarized these all these uh, all this discussion over here. Remember, the output is a weighted combination of the input. Therefore, if you're minimizing uh, the pth norm and p is equal to two, then this is going to pull the point, the weight vector, towards the origin. But it doesn't. And it doesn't allow the weight elements from going too large, but it doesn't necessarily lead them to be zero as well. Okay. On its own, it can lead to uh, the weight vector being zero, but having the empirical error minimization term added to this uh, element would have an impact, and then you will not be able to get a zero vector. So you will not be able to use it for feature selection. For it, it is going to give you a small weight vector norm, but it's not guaranteed that you would end up with feature selection as well. On the other hand, if you use uh, on the other hand, if you use uh, this bit, this uh, p is equal to zero norm, you may end up with uh, you will end up with a sparse with sparse features, so it can be used for feature selection, and then p is equal to one does a compromise between the two. Okay, so that is the impact of that. However, the optimization is difficult uh, in cases when p is not equal to two. Okay, that's the that's the essentially the impact of this. There are other variants of different types of linear models, and I welcome you to explore. So, for example, if you want to minimize both the square error loss function, but you also want to end up with only a handful of features that are in, that are important, you can use what is called a lasso uh, minimization problem. And note the only difference here is that instead of uh, having a two, you have one over here. So lasso uses the same loss function as uh, ridge regression, okay? But with a different optimizer, with a different regularizer. Okay. So ridge regression uses the same loss function as this one, but it uses a square error loss, uh, the square uh, regularizer. Whereas lasso uses minimizes the same error function, but with a different regularizer. So if you think about it, and I want you to play with it yourself, there are some really good codes available in sklearn. The solution that you are going to get, the weight vector solution that you are going to get with lasso is going to be much sparser in comparison to ridge regression or using support vector regression even, okay? So that is the impact of that. There are other types of uh, learning problems. There are other types of linear models available Within sklearn, for example, this is uh, the corresponding um, function, the error function for ordinary least square regression. We are trying to minimize the error between the target and the actual output. Uh, and this is simply the least square error, okay? So that is our least square error. So that is our loss function in this case. If we change this loss function to, and if, if we keep the same loss function, sorry, and add a regularizer, which is 
the two norm regularizer, we end up with an algorithm which is called ridge regression. If we change the regularization function from two norm, regular, norm regularization to one norm regularization, we end up with an algorithm which is uh, called lasso, and it gives us sparse solutions. So it does feature selection. It only bases its decision on features that it thinks are important, sparse solutions. Okay, so that's what it gives. You also have multitask lasso, so you can have multiple outputs, and you have another algorithm which has which is called elastic net. And what it does is that you can control whether you want to do two norm regularization or one norm regularization based on these hyperparameters, which are alpha and rho. So that's another algorithm that you can use, and this reduces to lasso or to ridge regression depending upon how you select these different parameters. There are multitask variants of it available as well. There's another algorithm which is called orthogonal matching pursuit. Uh, it's, it's a really simple algorithm that tries to minimize the square error loss, but also tries to uh, use the minimum number of weights, which are non-zero. So this does essentially the Z P0 no or sorry, the L0 norm optimization. Okay. So if you want a really sparse solution, this is the algorithm that you're looking for. Uh, you can also do, uh, we've already talked about this, this is logistic regression in which you have the logistic loss over here coupled with a uh, square uh, L2 regularizer, okay? You can also have a regularized perceptron, you can have robust regression which uses a different loss function and I welcome you to explore that. You can also have uh, what is called a Huber loss which is a loss function like this one, with this green line. So there are like infinite many variants of different type of algorithms, okay? And, and I cannot teach you all of them. What I want you to think uh, about is what is going to be the impact if you change the loss function and if you change the regularizer. So far what we've covered, and I'm going to give you a summary. If you change the loss function, you can change the, the problem from classification to regression. You can increase or decrease the robustness or it affects the robustness of our prediction. So for example, if I use ordinary least square regression, which uses a squared error loss function versus I use a support vector regression, uh, the support vector regression, because it has an epsilon insensitive loss function, it's going to be a bit more robust to outliers in your training data set in comparison to ordinary least square regression. Okay. At the same time, the loss function, the regularization function also has an impact, but that impacts how many weights would we end up that are non-negative, oh sorry, uh, that are non-zero. So if you use a squared error loss function, it's easier to optimize, a uh, squared error re uh, regularization function, it's easier to optimize, but at the same time, it may not lead to sparse solutions. Methods like orthogonal matching pursuit, on the other hand, because they are based on the zero norm, they try to minimize the number of non-zero weight vectors, essentially doing feature selection, but they're really difficult to optimize at times, okay? So try to wrap your head around the impact of each one of, the, one of those uh, factors individually in the structural risk minimization formulation. And the lesson that I want you to, to take in is that if you can define a loss function for a given problem, and a regularizer for that problem, you can essentially formulate it as an optimization problem and all that you need to do is to solve that optimization problem then. Okay, so this is the overall view of, so how do we solve, how do we go from solving classification problems and reg regression problems to solving other types of problems. And next time we are going to uh, discuss different types of regularization and uh, sorry, different type of machine learning problems. Okay, thank you.